Hey guys, it's Adam. I hope you guys are all doing really well today. Uh, this is going to be a two-part interview. So what you're watching right now is part one. Part two will come out a couple days after part one. This this part that you're watching goes live. Uh, it was a pretty long interview, and we're also trying different formats for the channel. So uh, we're going to be, break, be breaking this up into two parts. So stay tuned for part two. It will come out shortly after this one goes live. Now, with that said... I also wanted to chime in and say thank you to our audience or to the community for really, really supporting uh, us and the content that we create. It means so much to us. I cannot stress that enough. It really, really does. And it's extremely, extremely validating. Um, now, with that said, uh, my request is that if you are enjoying the content, if you could please subscribe to the channel, that would really help us out tremendously. I don't think you guys realize how much it helps for a channel that's trying to grow to get um, more subscribers. I think it sounds obvious, but uh, when you go through the analytics of the page, you, you notice that the majority of our viewers aren't even subscribed. So if you guys are liking the content, um, please subscribe if you feel like it. It would mean a lot to us. Regardless, I appreciate everyone. Thank you so much for watching. And I hope you guys enjoy this one. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Psychedelic Insights. Today, we have the pleasure of having on Elmer Piros, Senior Biotechnology Analyst. Um, we have had him on the show before, and our viewers, I got tons of messages from people saying how much they enjoyed that and how much they learned about looking at the, the psychedelic medicine sector from an investment perspective. But today uh, we have Elmer on because some exciting news was released from Small Pharma looking at their SPLO26, which is uh, their SPLO26 drug, which is intravenous DMT. When they administered it to, I believe it was, and correct me if I'm wrong, Elmer, 18 people taking SSRI medication who weren't responding fully to that medication once they were given DMT. 100% of them responded to the treatment one month later after one dose with supportive therapy, and 93% were in remission, and correct me if I'm wrong again, meaning that they no longer met the criteria for having depression anymore. Can you just help this put this into context to our viewers of like just how potentially game-changing this is? Yes. Um, so thank you for the invite, uh, Jake and Adam. Um, so when I when you see a headline of a hundred percent response and just a slight correction, ninety-two percent. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um that is unheard of. Uh this is something that you can go back to results with psilocybin, you could go back to um the recently approved drug called Vality, you can look back at the history of Zoloft, Prozac. You name it. You don't see in a small study or in a larger trial, you don't see 90 plus percent response and remission rates. Um, whether you check at the one week time point or one month time point, that just simply doesn't exist. And what is really reassuring with this data, um, that it actually we see an improvement of what Small Pharma previously disclosed, because you remember they had a trial which looked at depressed patients who were washed off from their SSRI treatment. And there they've seen a roughly 50% remission rate. And we can go into the detail of what the differences might be between here and in that trial. And that remission rate lasted, or the re remission lasted up to six months. Um, now, this study, the purpose of this study was not to replicate those results or not to, um, uh, to, to do a smaller or larger trial, but to examine whether if you compare, whether you, if you wash off people from the antidepressants versus if you keep them on, um, what would the impact of DMT be in these two cohorts? And they chose to have 12 people in the ones that continued an SSRI and only five in the group where they 
actually either these patients never been on an SSRI or they may have been washed off. Now, this is a small exploratory trial. So the question is, why haven't they looked at bigger numbers? Because the hypothesis that they wanted to see if there is a safety signal, I mean, people were concerned um, about um, adding a serotonin agent such as DMT uh, to someone who is already on another serotonin agent and the syndrome called serotonin syndrome that you could develop if you have an overdrive in the serotonin system that has some unpleasant side effects or effects. And they wanted to test. The, num the second thing which they wanted to test, as you know it from from uh, uh, non-clinical use, um, people either recommend to be abstinent from the SSRI or use a slightly higher dose of DMT or psilocybin to overcome um, the potential already effect that is in place due to the due to the SSRI. So they wanted to see if the effect dampens between the two groups, meaning if you are on an SSRI, the same dose, would it give a lower efficacy, fewer people go respond or uh, into remission versus the group that has been washed off or never been on an SSRI. And the surprising finding here is that the two works better <laughs> together. So in these 12 patients, you get to a 92% remission rate um, as opposed to um, something in the order of 20% for those five people um, that didn't take an SSRI at the same time. Now, the, one of the biggest caveats for a small trial, like this was a small trial, that if you think about what 20% means, that's one out of five patients. If the magic number is two out of five patients or three out of five patients, and you could change that. I mean, this could change by just randomly selecting another five individuals. Then the response rate in the control group is probably similar to what small pharma saw before in their SSRI naive trial. Okay. But the bottom line is that the concomitant use of SSRI did not weaken, but strengthen uh, the results. Mm. And that, that's what caught my eye, in addition to that, at least in this small sample of 12 people, they didn't observe untoward side effects, mm. uh, which would indicate either serotonin syndrome or some, something else, you know, this is one of the first trials when in a clinical setting, you add a psychedelic drug on top of an antidepressant. Um, I have like a, a question in terms of, do we know, and would this even make a difference? I'm sure it would make a difference, but like, do we know the d how many milligrams of what antidepressant the, the, the participants in the trial were taking? And mm -hmm. also on top of that, uh, wouldn't the fact that it's intravenous make a huge difference, let's say when compared to inhaled DMT in regards to how bioavailable it is in regards to just like getting the blood plasma levels up there like yep. right away? I mean, coming to your second question first, Adam, um, the surest way to administer a drug is to infuse it into the vein. 100% bioavailability, no question. When you inhale something, it depends on how well you inhaled, how long you keep it down um, for mm -hmm. things to take place in, in the lungs. So better you cough um, because it irritates your throat. Um, then you need to get a second dose because you coughed up the first one. So there is all that variability, but going into the vein, 100% of the intended dose will arrive to the system, uh, to the brain. Um, so that is a good foundation to have. And obviously not the most ideal way to administer drugs, IV. I mean, most 
uh, psychiatrist offices are not equipped to hook you up with an ID. Mm. That's why small pharma and now Cybin also working on intramuscular and intra and and uh, through the skin cutaneous yes. ways of administering the drug. The big difference there is that they have to figure out the dose, so it would still get to the same level as you were infusing it into the vein, um, or at least get the same number one psychedelic effect and number two most importantly therapeutic effect um, if you administer it in alternative ways um, but to come back could you remind me of your first question adam i'm sorry i answered the second one but i forgot the first one i think i was focused on you answering the second part i might have forgotten the first part of my question to be honest um, but through. with that said i guess we should just we can move on from the first part it probably wasn't that important anyway <laughs> <laughs> so Elmer, I'm just gonna, you know, I'm I'm curious here. So yeah, I read the press release from Small Farmer. They're saying this could be a strong signal that the SSRIs enhance the efficacy of the DMT. What I was wondering, and obviously I don't, I'm not questioning Small Pharma here. Could it? I was thinking, or what if the results were just better because you're not having someone withdrawing potentially on an SSRI, because as we know, it's hard for many people to come off of SSRIs and then going directly into a psychedelic experience. Yep. Could that be a reason why just maybe it wasn't the SSRIs that enhanced it. It was rather that just people didn't have to deal with the potential withdrawals uh, that happened with coming that's, off. Of them. That's a perfect alternative explanation, but it certainly doesn't diminish. Uh, okay. Right, because whatever, however we get to ninety percent, ninety two percent, yeah, rates, I'll take it. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're absolutely correct. So for most people, even if the SSRI does not work, um, and in this case, if you look at the baseline values, um, uh, and there is this measure, two measures, the MADRA score, and yeah. the so-called BDI, depression level. Um, index, both of those would indicate that these patients were either moderate or severely depressed before they got their DMT while on being on the SSRI. Got it. Obviously, the SSRI did not help them therapeutically. However, and this came out this handful of years ago, what we think now what SSRIs do is they prevent you from relapsing into a deep form of depression. So even worse than what these people had mm -hmm. at the baseline measurement. So mm -hmm. imagine if that if you withdraw, start withdrawing people from the SSRI, if they fall into this declining phase and you administer whether it's psilocybin or DMT to them while they are falling down, getting more and more depressed, that could shunt the effect of DMT or psilocybin. It could dampen the effect. And so that's the argument against hoping not to get people off their SSRIs because while they may not be providing a normal life uh, to them, but they prevent them from a severe relapse, which may lead to a hospitalization, for example. Do we do we know that people were actually withdrawing in, within the last trial? It's a good question. Because, like they said, you said it was a washout, but we don't know exactly. Like it, we don't know where they were at uh, in regards to one thing. I mean, it's it's unfortunately it's not black and white because they could could be declining mm -hmm. uh, if it's. If somebody's hospitalized because of a a, a, a severe uh, a worsening, they yeah. wouldn't have treated them in the in the previous trial, right? Um, so, you know, they looked at their probably at the time when they were uh, first uh, enrolled in the trial. They looked at their scores. They redrew the SSRIs over a several week period, and they looked at the group as a whole and their scores again um and it probably didn't change that much but that doesn't mean that an individual couldn't have gotten worse 
or three weeks into their withdrawal, the next day or two days later could have not fallen into that declining phase while you are trying to bring it up with a psychedelic drug. So unfortunately, it's, it's not uniform of how you relapse, to what extent you, you might relapse if you withdraw a drug. Um, and um, so it's, and, 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 you know, these measurements have, you know, standard deviation. If they check the score today versus tomorrow, you might come up with a different answer depending on whether you have a sunny day or it's been raining for the last four days as it has in New York. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, um, so my, qu another question I have, Elmer, um, so they've been using SPL026, I guess, to give them proof of concept for all these trials. So this is for the viewers who may not know, SPL026 is their, I guess, IV DMT. It's nothing, I guess, special. Maybe I, I know they have patents around and everything, um, but it's based on my understanding, they're very interested in looking at SPL028, which is their deuterated DMT analog, which will extend the trip to 45 minutes. Now, my question is, like if they get results this good with SPL026, what if the results just aren't as good? Maybe like the longer DM, is it possible the longer DMT trip wouldn't give results this good? I mean, I assume it would be. I, I mean, it's everything is possible. I think, you know, if you look at some of the, I think it's called DMTX, um, then people actually want to prolong the experience for hours and if not days, um, by a continuous infusion, um, speculating that, you know, if you spend more time in that other world, you might actually communicate with people who are also in that other world at the time, or it may have a, a, a better therapeutic effect, but it's all conjecture, it's all speculation. Um, I don't think that there is a reason to believe if the, that the same active uh, 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 chemical and uh, an entity, same molecule, just because it's slightly modified to be broken down at a longer interval versus shorter, would produce dramatically different clinical results. And I'm not even saying um, the psychedelic experience, because at the end of the day, especially now that we are dealing with patients, you want to look at the clinical benefit. Yes. Um, so there is no reason to believe that they would be different. Um, it's entirely possible that they have to play with the dose uh, eventually. So they have to figure out what the right equivalent SPL028 dose yeah. might be. But one thing is for sure. The IP on SPL028, the deuterated the DMT, is much more solid. Okay. Um, some people um, would avoid looking at secondary patterns, you know, formulations, salt forms, um, and they would only believe in the strength that this is a new chemical entity. And if we get approved, we get a 15 to 20 year monopoly with this yeah. one, as opposed to someone coming in after five years with a different DMT formulation and eat into our market. Uh, Jake, I actually had a question for you. Uh, you're talking about IV administration uh, for both the deuterated and SPL026? Oh. Well, so for SPL026, uh, SPL026 in this trial, it's their intravenous, but with SPL028, my understanding is they're looking at it as an intramuscular injection and Cybin is looking with their program at a subcutaneous injection. Okay, so we have IM and sub-Q aiming for about 45 minutes, whereas with the IV that they did with 026, how long were they keeping people under? I think the, 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 the full experience is maybe about 30 minutes, 15 minutes of total um, peak experience and then the coming down phase. So it's slightly longer. Um, but, you know, the bottom line is the IV work was done to essentially establish the foundation. Yes. All subsequent work with 028, which I think they're gonna focus on going forward, is going to be one or the other formulation. Which one 
is going to be better. They're going to have to check it out. Um, now they have two to work with, the Sibian subcutaneous or the small pharma um, uh, the intramuscular. And then they're going to make a decision which course to take forward. Yes. But, you know, all the SPLA026 work is proof of concept. That's why you don't see a trial um, like this drug-drug interaction trial at with SSRIs, 150 patients, because you just wanted to establish a base case that there is no negative impact, there is no negative dampening of the clinical effect. So later on, working with 028, um, you could expand and you know treat patients um, with SSRIs on board. And, and there is another interesting parallel here, which I just realized the other day. Uh, the Sibin trial with psilocybin, with a psilocybin analog, deuterated psilocybin analog, CYB03, is also done in patients who are not washed out. That's from right. SSRIs. So we're going to have in October some information that further strengthens the argument whether you need to wash people out. Uh, in parallel, these people didn't talk necessarily before they embarked on these experiments, but now that they are together, they'll jointly benefit, and the entire field will jointly benefit from um, the results that we're going to see soon. Hmm. So if you're, I, I mean, I'm looking at this as small pharma is kind of doing all the hard work for these other companies, like maybe a tie is just like, they just basically put out proof of concept for a tie to th uh, this is what I'm thinking at least like uh -huh. oh, it's a tie thinking like oh like okay it's, look at that result from small pharma with with SSRIs like maybe we're going to do that now is that possible in there and you know what I'm saying absolutely but you know <clears throat> but look at what compass is doing so it's again not necessarily black and white okay uh, compass also done the SSRI interaction study I don't think it was controlled. They just looked at what yeah. sort of response or be, uh, results would we get. And it was encouraging. It didn't introduce any side effects. It didn't weaken the signal. Um, so it was good. But they decided in their phase threes that they're going to wash out everyone from their SSRIs. So what are they, crazy? Um, not really. Because there is some advantage to establish the profile of psilocybin safety and efficacy as a single agent okay and the picture is not modded by something else or maybe multiple uh different agents being on the board um at, at the same time however you know one could argue that what, for example, the Compass is going to do, if if there is a need, they will allow the reintroduction of SSRIs if someone doesn't feel well after being treated with psilocybin. So they can, in a roundabout way, figure out what the two drugs together um, will produce in terms of side effects. So I don't think that there is a smart answer how to do this better to wash off everyone or go all the way and have SSRIs uninterrupted uh, because there are some advantages to both. And I mean, for approvability, you would think an enhanced signal, what small pharma put out yesterday, um, would be a blessing uh, because you definitely want to see something bigger, especially when you go control, uh, compare it to a control group. Okay. Now, Elmer, I just have one last question for you. And Adam, if you have any questions too, go ahead. This is my last one. So, you know, the way I understand it right now, Compass Pathways is looking to be third line treatment, TRD, or maybe someone failed even more than two options. Two, three, four. Um, okay. And I'm looking at Cyb and Small Pharma. They, the way I'm seeing it, they're looking to be positioned as second line treatment when you know someone's not responding completely to SSRIs. Now, I'm curious if there's any data that we have on depression 
maybe uh, any so any data we have on depression where someone is getting treated for the they're trying it for the first their first line is psilocybin or dmt like mm -hmm. that's the first thing is, is there any data out there on that all right guys that was part one of a two-part interview uh the second part will be uploaded within a couple days of this part of the interview going live so i just wanted to reiterate this is part one of a two-part interview uh if you guys want to see the second part of the interview i will eventually include it in the description of this video and if you follow the channel or subscribe to the channel you'll see the second part go live within a couple days of this one i hope you guys really enjoyed this thank you so much for watching uh like it subscribe and thank you once again